Hello, welcome back everyone. And uh, we've got a uh, great Women Tech Connect panel coming up right now, empowering women in the tech sector, mentorship, advocacy, and strategies for success. Um, this panel is being uh, run by Jen. Um, I'll let her deal with all the, the introductions. Um, we've got some great questions all lined up. So I will hand over to Jen now. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeremy. Yeah. Um, so I'm joined today by three fabulous ladies from the industry. Um, my name's Jennifer Holmes. I'm CCO at Lynx. Um, I've been with Lynx for, I think, 17 years now. Um, <laughs> I came in straight from university on a graduate recruitment scheme um, as sales administrator and over the years uh, worked in various positions in the sales team and um, I'm now CCO and on the board of directors for Lynx. So, um, I think a lot of people say to me, gosh, you've worked for that company for a long time, but it doesn't feel like the same company. Um, there's obviously the market's changed, the industry's changed, uh, CEOs have changed, staff has changed. So it does feel um, like uh, a lot of yeah, experience through those years. So um, I'd like you all to introduce yourselves, if that's okay, if we start with Virginia. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks very much for having me, for first and foremost. Um, my name is Virginia Petru. I'm the Global Marketing Director at BSO. Um, I've been there two years. So BSO, uh, if you don't know, it's a what well, we do network. We do low latency network cloud and managed services. Um, and I've been there two years. Previous to that, I was at a core banking software company for 12 years. So a bit like you, I started a graduate scheme and worked my way up to a leadership position. Great, thank you, Laura. Hi, thank you. Hi, I'm Laura Pobjoy. I'm head of corporate and commercial within the legal team at Telehouse. Um, I'm sure most of you know, but Telehouse is co-location services provider within the digital infrastructure business. Um, I've been at Telehouse for just over a year now, um, but previously worked for Royal Mail um, as a technology lawyer. Um, so most people don't really think of Royal Mail as being technology business, but at one point when I was there, they had 500 people in their internal technology function. So um, it, it, that was a, a good training ground for me in, in the technology world. <laughs> thank, and it's, uh, yeah, thank you, Jen. It's great to be here today to yeah, be able you. to speak to everybody about my, uh, my experiences. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. And Jana. Thank you. Uh, likewise, pleasure to be here. Hello, Link. <laughs> uh, Jana Glaub, Head of Network Procurement at Sky. Uh, so I look after the physical infrastructure side of things, plus a bit of hardware here and there. Um, similar to um, other people on the panel, I started my career at Retin as an office administrator. And I spent eight years there doing a variety of different roles from procurement, sales, career management, and I left as the managing director of the UK business. Great, thank you very much. So yeah, it's great to have you all here. So we'll kick off with um, general sort of chat experiences about uh, the lack of diversity in our industry in particular um, with women um, in, the, in the technology industry. So just, just in general sort of experiences you've had of that as you've sort of progressed through your career, have you noticed any changes, improvements along the way? I'm happy to kick us off. Yeah? So I mean, <laughs> First things first, just look around the room, right? I don't know if you can see it from a streaming perspective, but it's no denying that our sector is quite male dominated. Um, the same goes for my previous sector of technology. When I joined my first company, I'm going to show my age a little bit here, but in 2010, um, it was very, very male dominated as part of a graduate scheme. There are a few women um, and it was a complete shock to most people. I used to use the annual reports to see diversity changing because initially it was all men of a certain you know, diversity uh, background and, of a, and then it would progressively get better. So I think we are taking strides of, of making it better. Um, I have found when I've been recruiting people, it, it's, I am trying to, to find more women and such, but it is still heavily dominated um, around men and we do need to make more of an effort to try and encompass more women and, and trying to get them interested in being part of the sector. And do you feel that's because you're marketing, do you feel that's across the whole sort of departments within the industry? I think marketing, um, marketing HR, those departments often have more women within them. But if you look at my own team, I'm, yeah, it is a majority of men. Um, and part of that is also because marketing is becoming more technical. Um, and depending on where I'm recruiting, the people there, so for, as an example, Morocco, um, I've been trying to find more technical people there to do things like marketing automation and such, and I'm getting mostly men applying. Even when I look at the women's CVs, they're not necessarily at the right standard because they just don't really get interested, curious about that kind of thing. 
Um, so I think there are some departments that have more women than men, and but the more technical you get, I find that the less you get of, of a, a, an even split. Mm. I think I would agree with that from, from my experience. And I think that the legal profession is sort of comparable, I think, to marketing in that sense, because you can be, you know, a lawyer, legal, the legal function and particularly in-house legal arguably is more skewed towards females. Um, and so it, it sort of it shifts your perspective a little bit from a technology perspective. But as you start to look for people who've got more specific technical knowledge and you're really looking for that to um, be able to deliver the value that you want to as an in-house lawyer for a technology business, it, it's less um, it's less available. I think it's, it, it comes through less on people's CVs, um, particularly, I think, um, when you're looking for more experienced people. And I think perhaps that's maybe showing that it might be starting to change actually as you start to get people coming through um, at, at entry level on the legal front I think perhaps there is a bit more of an expectation that you need that specific technical knowledge to be a technology lawyer that's certainly shifted from from the legal industry and I think that's probably reflective of the fact that technology as an industry is is opening up um, but there's, yeah, there's still a long way to go, I think. Um, and I think it's, it's masked in larger organisations in particular because you do have more women in functions like legal or marketing or procurement. Mm -hmm. But when you look at the pure sort of technologists, there's, there's still um, much, much more slanted towards, yeah. um, to more, towards yeah. men. And Yana, you've gone, gone from working with Retin, which is a smaller company, to Sky. And mm -hmm. obviously, out of all of us on the stage here, you're probably more integrated into the technical side of things. So what's your experience been? I think it's definitely very different now than when I joined the industry, probably about 10 years ago. Um, you know, you've got women that are a lot more visible. You know, you've got Kerry Gill, the CEO of Colt, and others that, you know, um, have shown that obviously there are women in that industry. And I think in general, it is improving a little bit. Um, as I was saying at Sky, it's, it is a large organization. And so we do have a lot more women. I think the average for tech is about 17%. Um, at Sky, we're about 26% of uh, women in tech roles, but there's still a lot more to do in that space. Yeah, yeah. And um, what experiences have you guys had of you know, we know, we know what the situation is and um, we've got different initiatives and I think you've all had experiences of mentoring programmes. Um, what, what, what do you see happening in the industry to try and even up the, the equality side of things? I think, I mean, I think you always need mentors, you know, whatever your gender, whatever your experience. I think mentors um, are, are, uh, are what really helps you to progress through um, uh, you know, within an industry, within a, um, a, a, on a career path, because you need support. I think everybody does. But I think the more that you can see people who are similar to you in what, whatever that might be, we're talking about women. So if you see women in senior roles who women, or women who are there to support you, then that's always going to help. Um, I think I've been particularly fortunate, actually, in my, my legal career. Um, I've had two particularly good mentors uh, who I've worked for, um, one male, one female, actually, for what it's worth. Um, but I think that the male mentor early in my career recognised that it was different for women. So he used to talk to me about kind of, oh, you should talk to this woman, <laughs> this was senior women in senior roles. And I think that's kind of, I suppose, the, the plea to the room, you know, of men um, is to, it, you don't have to be a woman to mentor a woman. You can just recognise the skill set that's there. And I think it's a lot of it for organisations and for individuals is recognising the benefits that diverse thinking can bring to an organisation. And I think that's the key to sort of unlocking us moving from the 25% up to the 50%. Yeah, and uh, that diversity is across the board, isn't it? Mm, it's, for sure. yeah. it's not only women, it's absolutely minority yeah. groups as well. Yeah, getting yeah. different backgrounds, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think it's also important to make um, a note of a distinction that, you know, it isn't you're not supporting women or you're a mentor, right? There's also things in between. You can be a role model, you can give women and um, people in general opportunities, right? If you think that they would be the right fit for a project, but for some reason, you know, there is something there, then definitely do give them the opportunity. Um, I know at Sky and I'm certain with other organizations as well, we um, 
have a lot of programs in place. Um, some of them are targeted at women, for example, uh, Lift As We Climb, which is specifically women in leadership after a certain uh, level uh, of banding in, in terms of your progression and career at Sky. But we also um, do something called circle mentoring, which is essentially just supporting people from diverse backgrounds, early careers um, in, in that space through their uh, progression at Sky. Yeah. I've personally been mentoring um, through a association called um, the Girls Network. Um, it was actually established because they realized that girls weren't putting themselves in positions where um, they would be working in the city and such. So they went on a school outing and some of the girls were going, well, why are all these women wearing suits? Um, and it hadn't occurred to them that a woman could actually have a job which would require going into the city and wearing a suit. So they started up this organization and the whole idea behind it is to go into schools and speak to women who are right at the beginning to try and get them curious about other jobs like roles that could be going towards a leadership role. So it's all around that. And I think that's, that's the way we can try and move forward to excite these people. Um, I've personally been incredibly lucky that I have had some really strong mentors, but they've all been men. Um, in fact, I find that women sometimes struggle to support other women. I don't know if it's because we see each other as competition, um, but I do feel that men ha have been very supportive. They've made it clear to me that I need to not put myself in a position where I'm you know, ultimately the person taking notes in the meeting or getting the coffees and things like that. I've often been the only woman um, in a senior role in, in a room full of men and making sure that you position yourself that way. And I, that was really useful for me. Um, it's something that I never used to try and do, but I do forcibly do it now, maybe a little bit too much sometimes. <laughs> but I think at the end of the day, it's all about balance. And I think, I mean, to that point about kind of why perhaps women don't mentor as much, I think it, it goes back to almost emulating what you see. And actually, if what you see when you get to a senior role is that you almost have to kind of be a bit more, uh, be a bit less soft, arguably. I think it's perhaps seen as to be There's in that support words, role. Them, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there is that kind of, not that you don't want to, but that you, perhaps it's been a challenge to get there yourself and then you're kind of focusing on your own challenges. So I think it's it's a good reminder that we, we need to be advocates as well for, um, for, for women coming up through. Um, and I think it's about shifting that mindset of kind of being true to yourself. I think that's one of the challenges around um, you know, being in a minority of whatever nature in an industry is you kind of feel as though you have to be like everybody else when actually you want to be, you want to bring something different to the table and actually that's the benefit. And I think that's perhaps the key to think about um, it, what additional benefits are you bringing by being something different to what's already there? Yeah, I think particularly this industry, it starts young, right, doesn't it? It's, it's going down yeah. to the schools, the universities, really. And I think everybody, all the companies in this room will have their own sort of schemes and programs to, to recruit and making sure there's diversity across the board. Um, and I know at links that Anne Bates has been working with um, local colleges that we've had a couple of female interns come through um, from work experience and they come back as interns and one of the ladies has come in twice. So it's, it's planting those seeds, isn't it? And working with the work experience, working with the universities, working with the schools as I get. And we had um, a member presentation a couple of years ago. Um, I can't remember which member it was, but um, they were really, really good at this. Even, um, you know, down to the, you know, the, the people working on the streets, the putting the fibre in the ground, and he was showing all these brilliant pictures of the diversity they had at that level, and he was really proud of, of that quality. So it is happening, and it is, it is working, it can be done. It's just a case of really working through those programmes, I think. Mm. It's yeah. trying to increase the volume, isn't it? Make it more, yeah. more the norm. But I think, as you say, it goes back to schools and education, and yeah. um, I've got two young children myself, and the eldest has sort of hit the school age and that sort of gender stereotyping hits you in the face yeah. um, and you know it's there you know it's there from toys and from clothes and whatever but mm -hmm. it, it is embedded and I think it does it takes quite a lot of effort to fight against it um, oh yeah it's uh, a huge cultural thing isn't it yeah it's different um, through different continents different countries yeah yeah absolutely and I think you, you kind of I think perhaps teachers as well it's kind of it's giving everybody that visibility and kind of taking all those opportunities you can to kind of show what what 
other options there are, like you say, that women can wear suits and go to work and do different things. Yeah, um, and there's, I was just thinking there's been reports as well about, um, you know, analysing women throughout all industries, really. And um, at the starting positions, it's quite equal. And then at the higher positions, they're obviously all being targeted on getting women into board positions, into senior management. So that's starting to change. But there seems to be this broken rung in the career ladder. It's that middle section, that manager, that middle management, management that seems to struggle with the, the, the diversity and inclusion because mm -hmm. the starting position is great when people are first coming into their careers and that's quite equal. And then it maybe hits that, that point where uh, people are deciding what to do with their careers. And then obviously the top section, because they're being targeted and measured on it, they're making a conscious effort to get women in. But is there something, moving on to our next topic a little bit, about that, that hiring, that promotional section? I mean, there's, there's lots of studies into the unconscious bias of... Um, even female HR managers, there's been tests that they put put CVs in front of them and they're almost identical, but one's got women's name, one's got a man's name, and they say, oh, it's a technical position, subconsciously saying, actually, we think that person would be better. Um, do you think that's still the case or is that a thing of the past? Have you had any experience of that? I think that's a very good question. And I think unconscious bias, right? It's not just hiring for women, it exists at the intersection of society, right? So covering all different diverse groups and background and it absolutely does still exist. Um, I think at organizational levels, um, there's definitely efforts being made to kind of counteract that. I'm sure most people here have done bias training and everything that's associated with that. But it's also, I think, a personal responsibility to an extent as well of every hiring manager and every person to kind of check themselves and say, hey, you know, how am I approaching this? Would I be saying something different if this was a person of a different gender or maybe a person of colour or whatnot? You know, these conversations we should be having with ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think that can come back to mentorship as well. I mean, you don't have to be an official mentor of somebody, but we all know and we've spoken about it in a group Genuity. that... Um, um, this again loads of studies that show you've got a job description and then you have uh you might have a man looking at the role thinking like oh there's there's one thing on that that i can't do um but i'll you know i can definitely do it and a woman might think sorry the other way around <laughs> the uh, a man uh, the, you know that perception of oh i can i can do this and having that self-confidence mm -hmm. so it's also about championing other women isn't it and um trying to persuade them that yes, you can do this, even though there might be one thing on there that you're, you're not an expert in, it's okay, you can still do it and you need to go for it. Yeah, I think that's right. I think confidence is, is a big thing. I think I look back at how I was in my early career and you, I, I felt as though I needed to have, or have the knowledge before I could do the role. Whereas actually I think, you know, perhaps that's, you question yourself, you're like, is that a female trait or is that just a personal trait? Mm -hmm. But I think it is, as I've gone through my career, I do see that more with women coming up through the profession. And when I worked in a, in a law firm with the trainees, it, it, there was definitely a difference in the kind of approach in terms of the level of confidence and the expectation about what the role was. I think going back to your kind of taking the notes, you know, you don't really get, you didn't get complaints from the female trainees about having to do the photocopying bit or the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the mundane tasks, but, you know, the male trainees are the ones wanting to be in the meetings and on the calls and do the things that actually the, the senior lawyers are doing. And I think, I mean, I'm not saying that's an absolute always, but I think there's definitely more of a trend towards that with women. And I think, again, it goes back to sort of that unofficial mentoring, doesn't it, of kind of um, recognising it in your teams and um, giving people that space and that opportunity to, to overcome that um, and to give them the encouragement that, you know, it, the, the training should be part of progressing up through the roles. You know, you, you can learn, you learn as you're doing it, you learn from experience. You can't just magic that up overnight and, and that's okay. Mm. I mean, I've been privileged enough to, to have that kind of opportunity come to me. So, I was not trained in a lot of the roles that I did, but my previous place was just like, just get it done. Also, it was cheap, so that helped. <laughs> However, it was very much a, a case of do it, sink or swim. Um, and I swam and that I'm, I use my examples, whether it's a, a guy or a woman, it doesn't really matter. You can do it. 
Nowadays, we've got so many tools at our disposal. You can learn practically anything as long as you've got some logic. That's the main thing I look for when I recruit um, is logic. But it doesn't stop me from having imposter syndrome. A lot of the time, I was not part of this, uh, this sector at all when I joined BSO. And that was something I actually went to conferences like these to try and understand a little bit of the nitty gritty from an engineering perspective. Because for me, once it clicks, I'm fine. But I want to be mm. overqualified in order to be able to sit at that meeting. Um, and I think imposter syndrome is a, is a big deal. It's something that I think all of us feel, but maybe women find that that holds them back a little bit. Mm. And I don't know if it was uh, Jana or Laura, but one of you during the briefing was mentioning about the fact that people tend to hire people similar to themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think that does encourage the bias, whether it is mm. from a you know, background, cultural background or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. it is very, very difficult to kind of come out of your comfort zone because you're confident about the person because you're like oh well they're like me I know exactly how they're going to tick I'll be able to manage them mm -hmm. whatever it might be um, and I try and hire people that are not like me probably why I'm <laughs> hiring so many men but ultimately <laughs> um, it is yeah it's something that we do need to try and do a little bit and and be conscious of that bias especially when it comes to things like maternity um, sure. some companies are now giving paternity that's equal to maternity I think it's very very few and far between but that's a great step because ultimately it means when you see a guy's CV and a woman's CV, either of them could have babies. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter. You know, either, like, and, and going back to your point of having that little break in the career side of things. Yeah, well, maybe some of those women are coming back from maternity leave and that's why they're now in those senior positions. But they, they kind of had a chunk where they weren't there. Um, and that's still important. A woman going on maternity leave is quite normal. A guy is still the exception to the rule. Well, and I think that's where that point comes in around kind of looking at what opportunities you can offer to your teams generally and not just thinking I need to give women more opportunity to be able to do childcare and be flexible. Actually, the, the real benefit would be giving that opportunity to the men so that the women who are working in other companies can then go and do what they want to do. And I think, you know, as as a mother myself of two young children, I kind of I feel like I'm really in that kind of hot spot of um, of that potentially sort of impacting your decisions about your career. And I think, um, you know, you talk about that middle gap, that's where that hits really, because you've, you, you know, you get people who then take a break away for however long it might be. And then they're making decisions based on potential, you know, earning opportunity or the potential to get to where they want to be at the top. And if it's seen that, you know, okay, it's an outside chance because yes, there are women at the top, but it's few and far between or they're kind of they're just the most the highest performing people ever in their industry and you kind of feel like you have to be that perfect person to be able to do it then it's all it's too easy to, to sort of take that step back and give your career the second you know, second priority to family even if you know even if you've got the support from you know your other half or whatever it might be to be able to do it it's not, it's not about there perhaps not being the opportunity there with the jobs. It's about making sure that the, the infrastructure is there around it. And I think there's a long way to go. And this isn't purely tech sector, but um, there's a long way to go in terms of government policy, childcare, um, a shift in kind of what it genuinely means to have flexible working. Because mm -hmm. I think we've, yeah, we have come a long way, but it's, it's still... It's a complete mindset shift. And again, yeah. going back to different cultures, I was in a room with um, 50 people from all different uh, countries and we were talking about this and I was saying, wow, if there was equal paternity in the UK, my husband would have loved that. Mm. He would have been like, you go, I'll, I'll do it. And there were people in the room from Russia and from different European countries being like, we just wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Even if it meant we, you know, they would say, well, what, what would just, the perception of that culture would just be like, no way, we're, we're not doing that. Why would we do that? So it's going to take generations, isn't it, to, <laughs> to change that mindset. Um, but you mentioned flexibility there, going on to another topic of ours about, you know, that work-life balance, which I don't, I've never been a fan of that phrase, <laughs> but um, this just doesn't affect women. It affects all of us and especially the, the flexibility that's come in since covid do we think that's a good thing, a bad thing? Jana, have you had experience of, um, you know, flexible working and the work-life balance? How do you deal with that? Yeah, I think that's a really um, interesting topic because actually, um, and I think we referenced the McKinsey report a little bit earlier, mm -hmm. but uh, flexibility is one of the most important things um, when considering jobs or keeping jobs or being happy in their jobs for women specifically. For men, I think it's somewhere halfway down, if not lower. Um, and I do think, you know, hybrid flexible working is very, very important. Um, working remote is also very important, but it's, it was something 
that was shown that could work. And um, I know that now, you know, some companies are rolling back on that opportunity. And actually, I wonder whether that's going to do um, a bit more damage uh, in the sort of short and near term in that sense, because um, women will just have to make different, different considerations. I think in that space in particular, um, you know, or with your kids, right, it's kind of always sort of the expectation is that the primary parent culturally is tends to be a woman. And so there's always childcare responsibilities. But outside of that, there's also other caring responsibilities that women take, whether it's, you know, relatives, neighbors, or the social obligations and things that you have to carry for yourself and also your partner and other family members um, that, you know, take up a lot of time and a lot of that headspace. Uh, which need to be accounted for as well. Yeah, and I think the, I mean, I don't know when it came in and things, but it was, I think it was before COVID, we, we all suddenly got teams on our phones. And, and, and I went, oh, brilliant, this is great, because sometimes I used to have to rush out for something. And, you feel, and I always felt like I was on like this bungee cord back to my laptop almost. So <laughs> I'd be out and then I'd be watching the clock, get back to my laptop, who's messaged me? And then when Teams on the phone, you know, I can do the school run now. And, and this, I mean, I'm quite regularly walking down the road on my phone, <laughs> like answering Teams messages whilst walking to the school gates. Um, and I personally find that really helpful However, when do you switch off? And this isn't just for women, it's for, for everyone. And that, that change since COVID of, are you switched on the whole time? When, when, is, mm. when is enough enough? And actually it's got its pros and cons, hasn't it? That yeah, I think it absolutely it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? Because like you, everybody thinks, oh great, we can, it means we can go where we need to be and we're still connected or you can finish at a certain time and then come back and work on the laptop later and people say that like it's a really good thing but I think that is culturally perhaps in this country more um, commonplace than than perhaps in other sort of European countries in particular but I think you've got and again we sort of we've kind of hit on this topic of it being you know, the issue for women around kind of the caring and the sort of um, the home admin role being the predominant one. And I'm sure there's people in the room thinking, well, I, I do a lot of that as well. And the men do. And, you know, my husband does. So it's not that that's not the case. But I think it's the case for that is having flexibility for all, because if you get equality in the flexibility and the opportunity to make use of that and I think obviously the, the sort of the cultural acceptance that you can as a man also start put your hand up and say well sorry I've got to leave because I've got to go and pick the kids up mm. that once you've got that equality there then it should flow that you have equality in terms of the the level of diversity in the organizations because it allows everybody to do it and it's sort of flexibility for each individual not sort of flexibility for yeah. a group of people and I think that's kind of that's the where we're at I think sort of moving it on from what's seen as flexibility for a group of people who perhaps have all seen as having the same interest but actually it's it's giving people that opportunity to to work as an individual in a way that suits their their lifestyle and their commitments mm -hmm. and obligations. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important also just from a mental health perspective. So whether mm. you've got kids or not, I don't have kids, but I, I know that my, like when I was in my previous place, there was a point where I was doing three rules in, in one go. Someone had gone on maternity, I'd inherited the rule and everything else. And I was working from 4 a.m. to 10 p.m. quite regularly, whether it was weekends or not. I took my laptop to Bali on holiday. <laughs> I remember walking away from dinner because I had to go and do a, a conference call in my beautiful room and stuff. And when I joined BSO was the first time in years that I'd left, gone on holiday without my laptop um, because I had like, by this point, I didn't need it yet or anything like that. But ultimately it is important even no matter what your circumstance is to have that flexibility. And I've had employees that want to go to the gym really early in the morning and start work at 7 a.m. and finish slightly earlier. Mm -hmm. I gave them that flexibility, whether they've got kids or not, I don't really care. If, if you give people flexibility, you should keep it equal for yeah. everyone, no matter what their circumstances are. And happy employees actually produce more. So it's a win-win. Um, it is challenging. People think that if you're not in front of your laptop, then you're not working. I mean, honestly, I've got it on my Apple Watch. I've got Slack everywhere. Um, I'm constantly on my phone, constantly replying. You can get hold of me at any point in time. I was in Singapore for work and at 1 a.m. I was on the call to our CFO and it's like, yeah, no worries, it's fine, you need me, it's okay. Um, 
that's not really helping the work-life balance. Side of <laughs> I was just about to say, is that okay? <laughs> well, it is to a certain extent because it means that if I want to go and get my hair done, I'm, I'll do it with my phone, and you know, it is what is. Um, yeah, it's you know, give and take, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. As long as there is that, as long as I don't it's mind. the give. Yeah, it's got to be yeah. both ways, hasn't it? I think that. And it's the same with my team. At the mm. end of the day, if you have a doctor's appointment, no, don't book it in, mm. but don't moan that you had to work an extra hour the next yeah. day, whatever, you know, it is, yeah. Uh, and I suppose, just, I suppose bringing it back to the tech industry and talking about kind of people being brought back into the office a bit more, it's interesting that a lot of the high profile names that you hear around that are tech businesses. Um, I mean, uh, there's a, I think, well, my perspective on it is there's also a slant towards US tech mm, businesses, yeah. but they're the ones that you hear, like, oh, Zoom want people back in the office, or <laughs> Google want people back in the office. And, you know, that, that perhaps is a bit of a lens on the tech industry needing to kind of be more flexible um, in the way that we've talked about and kind of allowing people to have a work-life balance and yeah. um, recognising that, you know, you can do things in different ways and still have the same productive output. Yeah. yeah, and just to start wrapping up, if somebody had said to me sort of five, six years ago when my kids were younger, I mean, they're 10, 7 and 5 now, if someone had said to me, what, what needs to happen in the industry to help women with their careers, I would have said flexibility. I would have said, you know, being able to just understand that, I mean, I'm quite... I'm, I'm, I'm not an early riser, I'm a forced early riser, <laughs> but I will quite often do a good two hours work before school run, but then by four o'clock I want my gin and tonic and I'm starting to switch <laughs> off. So, um, but that flexibility helps me because I, I can work around it. Um, and that was brought on mostly because of COVID and because we were all doing it. Um, so I would say that making sure that we don't go too far now and we're switched on the whole time and, and setting an example to others in the company and not answering emails at the weekend or you know trying to set that example of that healthy balance for everyone. So I would have probably said that was the change that was needed for women in the industry back then. But as your sort of closing remarks, what, what one thing, well, not maybe not one thing, but what do you think's a big, a, something that needs to happen in this industry to help with equality across the board. Maybe put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll go with the education side of things. So I think that starting young and making sure that people are aware of any opportunity that they can have, right? Whether, no matter what their background is, whether they're women, men, or diverse, or whatever they choose to be, I don't really care but that they can be whatever they want to be, that there is no restriction and it's basically your own abilities that will guide you as to where you want to go. That would be my closing bit. Cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I have to say that was the thing that was jumping into my head. And Sorry. I think, well, but no, perhaps, <laughs> that's sure. the, perhaps that tells you that that is, the, that is an important thing because it, I think it is about kind of showing the opportunities that are available and um, for everyone to take the um, take the opportunities available to them to kind of showcase what you do, what the industry you work in. You know, it, we do all work in an industry which isn't always visible to kind of, let's call it the general public. So I think take that opportunity to talk to your friends or your family or the teachers at school, whoever it is, to kind of say, this is what I do, because then they will see, okay, you're a woman, you're in that role. So that in itself will help. I think it's it's gradual, won't happen overnight. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's it, right? We've nailed it. It's the word opportunity and it's to show opportunity to everybody um, working with different, different diverse um people out there and I think it is happening and it is happening probably at a faster rate than it was before but there's definitely scope to accelerate um, with that for all of us. Brilliant okay well I think that's our time so thank you very much for all coming here today and sharing your thoughts and experiences I think that was really interesting thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs>